things began in Nubia about 10,000 years ago uh, as, the, as the rains moved northward by some 800 kilometers from their current location. When the cultures first emerged into our vision about 10,000 years ago in the so-called beginning of the uh, Neolithic period, what they had was uh, a common set of, of pottery traditions that already existed. They already had cattle. And by the way, they used a, a, a weapon, a harpoon, that is sort of a common feature of the culture. This stretched almost from the Atlantic to the uh, Red Sea, as you can see by the little X's and spots. This uh, a whole example of uh, East. With this common, say, ceramic technology and hunting technology, nevertheless, there uh, grew rapidly uh, a set of divisions, cultural divisions, and shall we say symbolic culture, traditions of peck and incised decoration, occasionally painted, which show relationships that go as far as Uwenai. The story is, in other words, it's not about just the Nile anymore. This 800 kilometers northward is documented by a major expedition led by the uh, from the University of Cologne, like this, where which are nowadays uh, just have a little bit of scrub vegetation. This is near the Dongola Reach. There were seasonal water bodies. Uh, they now are dried up. They refer to them as playas based on the southwest, but really they, were, they rapidly expanded and contracted. And then finally, farthest to the word, near the area of Khartoum, it was much more vegetated, roughly like something like this, that's now found only to the south, and say the Nuba Mountains for this example. So, cattle, which appears at about 10,000 years ago in North Africa, and of uh, animals a little later. By about 5 to 4,000 BC, what we see are nodes of occupation and settlement that uh, appear along the Nile. Notice the Wadi Hawar, the Wadi Omelik, the Wadi Mugadda. All of these were major water courses at this early time. The accomplishments were considerable, and the refinement also considerable, something that uh, is not merely some, uh, a, perhaps just a village, oops, wrong direction, a village culture, but something a little stronger. Here, a uh, near Kadruka, near the third cataract, a uh, plan of a cemetery was perhaps uh, built by, around, uh, constructed around a burial of a major person. And on the right, Cairo, a major concentration of burials there, and near Shindy, several uh, large cemeteries, one of which is reconstructed as having had up to 3,000 burials. Now, the largest cemetery in pre-First Dynasty Egypt in Nakata had something like 2,200. There was clearly major developments in Sudan at this time. And you get an idea of the workmanship and some of its influence northward. That is the big story of northeastern Africa in the period 10,000 to 4,000, is the movement northward of culture. The discoid macehead, which is the uh, ancestor of the Nakata period discoid macehead in Egypt. Types of palettes that gradually changed of the palette format of Upper Egypt, and then of course pottery vessels here of a type that is found in earliest phases of culture in Upper Egypt. In this cemetery, you see the earliest stele. And this is from Akkad at the third cataract. We here see two. We see bowmen hunting first at Ibex here, and I think an antelope uh, just to the right. But a little bit more detailed symbolic culture, the emergence of this kind of uh, monument 
mortality is found on a rock at Akkad, nearby where you see the hippo hunter, who harpoons the hippo, and it's direct comparison from the earliest phase of what they call the Nakata culture, about 3800 BC. This was a fundamental piece of symbolism in the Faryonic culture that lasted right down to, say, Roman times. Here we see it at Edfu. In southern Sudan, this is the, let's say, the physical manifestation of this Artum Ethnographic Museum, a uh, hippo hunter's skiff uh, built at or a bunch of reeds. Uh, again, out in the desert in this period before 4000 BC, monuments, the nature of which we really don't quite understand. This discovered by the Southern Methodist Expedition, uh, large stones, the arrangement of which is not short, but a smaller arrangement here whoops, in circles. So, the meaning is it's possibly astronomical. We just really don't understand this as yet. There are more than one of these. This one was found by the SFU expedition in a place called Nabta Playa, which is uh, directly west of the site of Kostol and the practically at the Sudan. Egypt meets Sudan and Libya. was found this circle by the famous explorer Banyol, and then a more recent photograph. And there is another one somewhere near the sands. So this is a cultural pattern in the desert don't fully understand. And it illustrates the second piece of the story, the diversity part, in a very fairly dramatic way. That is, the idea of a unitary culture, although we see many common features in the pottery and the technology that stretch toward the Atlantic, nevertheless, there is a diversity here. Now, at about 3800 BC, along the Northern Nile, an uh, interesting phenomenon occurred. Egypt had been, the upper Egypt had been settled uh, with, the, as you saw, uh, basically this northern movement had closed in on the Nile and the development of diverse, uh, this kind of localization of culture, you saw the, the start of what we call the Nakata period. And just south of Aswan, you see this merging of Nubian and Egyptian features. Here we see uh, Nakata one period, period type pottery uh, in a circular Nubian style tomb. It's also a very rich one. And we have yet fully to understand the complexity of even this early phase of what is called a group starting about 3800. As both uh, Dr. Stemberling and Harvey have pointed out, the excavations by the Oriental Institute and Postul revealed this cemetery of very large tombs, uh, which would just go through in a dramatic landscape. And uh, in, a, in other aspects of it, it's very possible that the landscape really led these people to bury these uh, very important individuals, I would consider them uh, baryonic style rulers at this early phase, and then later again in uh, about 375 AD to uh, again uh, put rulers in this location. The tombs themselves up to 10 meters in, in length with side chambers are very unusual uh, interpretations uh, could vary as to what they actually mean. They differ from contemporary royal tombs in Egypt, which are clearly made in imitation of houses, either a pathway or a boat or some other kind of thing, a trench with a side chamber. There were some, there's very little known about settlements of this a group phase. There, however, was this very large uh, building with an apsidal end, uh, was a stone substructure found at a place called Nafia, somewhat to the north of Kustol. And we've seen this, this uh, comparison of the Kustol incense burner, the monumental incense burner that shows the depictions of very ionic type uh, of non-smoking incense burner with its smoking bunnies. Piece of the 
uh, probable incense of a, a little piece of a cake and maybe mud models of them uh, on the uh, left. So it's not the only one of these uh, incense burners that were decorated with these uh, paneling. And I think the development of this scheme has already been shown to you, but we'll show all sides of it as it was then, as it was displayed. Basically, the, on the uh, far end, a palace facade or seraph enclosure uh, with the procession of three boats, well, apparently the foremost towing the other two uh, with a sail on it, a bound prisoner with a guard uh, in the center, a pharaonic ruler with a white crown, uh, either of Upper Egypt or indicating the king in his person with a falcon in front of it. I restored it as having to be on a Sarek, but uh, it may not have been on a Sarek, it may have been on some other object. And then after a couple of figures, which may be interpretable, but we won't go into it now for reasons of time, a uh, land which has behind it a standard, and the standard behind a figure in Pharaonic art indicates that it is a god. This is the first of the great lion gods of Nubia. And we'll see it, 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 it is again to be seen. Well, probably it'll be shown later in Pharaonic times. It's the things that indicate, uh, let's say, symbolism of, there's a meter, I think, in diameter, uh, painted with these uh, raptors uh, attacking serpents and then some kind of shrine. This fits in with a whole series of what they call animal style art or animal uh, procession art from uh, Upper Egypt. Here's something found uh, a knife handled in the Brooklyn Museum and then another uh, piece of a uh, painting uh, bound at the stone, which shows vultures devouring the slain. It, this, in later times, became, was a uh, decoration adopted in Egypt as a kind of military award from Kush in about 2000 BC where the golden fly was an important symbol that is found buried in tombs particularly of warriors. Well, this is the earliest of the golden flies and it was found in a tomb of a high official at Kustol by Sealy. It's now in the Cairo Museum. It's quite a small one, but it is gold. This is a summary of the let's say, symbols that later are used as writing in Pharaonic Egypt as they appear in Nubia. And you can see that this is a participation. The harpoon, the serac, the falcon, ha arms, and it's even raising arms. Typically, we would consider normally these carnelian beads and, and uh, pendants as being of Egyptian origin. Um, however, the mine where Carnelian was derived or obtained was recently discovered not all that far from Kustol out in the desert in Nubia. So are we going to then believe that the Carnelian was mined in Nubia, shipped to Egypt, manufactured and shipped back? Question. Here we see ivory objects like uh, we have a spoon, which is characteristic of this uh, later part of the so-called Nakata period, both in Egypt and in Abu Nubia. And then gold point, uh, ivory points, which uh, still are used in southern Sudan, like so in the cartoon of the Gurkha Museum. Here we see fragments of furniture, not just furniture for use, but a kind of symbolic appearance of what was almost certainly some kind of bed in the royal tombs of Kustal and how it was used in royal tombs later on. And uh, this is an Apoch period uh, tomb at El Kuru, which will probably be shown later. And then some very enigmatic objects, and I will not try to interpret them at this point, but there were uh, several thousand of them in one heap in the very same tomb of a high official at Kostol. Many of them are on display now. Yeah. 
So I'm going to leave you with uh, one or two in such a brief time uh, of the so-called big ideas that have been developed over the last uh, 20 years or so by uh, major field workers uh, in Sudan. Uh, first of all, the one by, from the University of Kaun that it was the southern, the south to north movement that began the progress or development of monumental culture in northeastern Africa. 